As part of LFA 2022, we're sharing five news stories exploring the key people and projects shaping the Royal Dock. From City Hall and Kamal Chunchi Way, to Tate and Lyle, the Factory Project, and London Design and Engineering UTC. We hope by listening to these conversations, you'll learn more about both the history and present day of the Royal Docks. The series followed on from our Power Podcast series in 2020, which explored and celebrated the hidden yet fundamental infrastructure site at the heart of keeping the Royal Docks running. For our third conversation, I'm joined by Sophie Hardcastle, Head of Engagement at Street Space, and Asif Shakur, Independent Scholar, exploring BAME seafarers in the First World War. We're going to hear from Asif in a little bit, but to start with, we're joined by Sophie to explore the process behind the renaming. Sophie, could you quickly introduce yourself and your connection to the project? Hi, my name is Sophie Hardcastle. I am the Head of Engagement at Street Space. And Street Space is a social enterprise based in Barking. And we work with communities and people to help reimagine their streets and spaces to make them feel safer, um, more joyful and focusing on social connection. Amazing. So how did Street Space initially get involved with the renaming of what now is uh, Kamal Chanchi Way? To be honest, I don't know. But I think because we're quite close to the Royal Docks area being based in Barking, and um, we have started to like branch out to do projects across London, we were approached to create a series of conversations to have with people of the Royal Docks area around what Siemens Brothers Way could be renamed as, but also to create a kind of treasure trove of potential future names and a guide to guide the process of naming streets and spaces across the area in the future because it is kind of an area that's going through and a lot of kind of fast paced change and regeneration. Amazing so what was the process where do you start on something like that? So I think we essentially did a very very similar process to kind of most of our engagement projects but I think essentially what we like to do is first start by a process of discovery so understanding who's in the area and how we can work with them to devise the process so as not kind of enforcing a process of workshops or engagement or conversation onto the local residents but working with them to to devise a process that they want to be part of that helps us come to useful interesting and meaningful names so uh, we collaborated with Radlack a community centre in the area and also Custom House Bookshop a really really interesting bookshop in the area and just spoke to them about how they might go about Uh, renaming Siemens Brothers Way and coming up with a treasure trove of future names from them and speaking with the Royal Docks team and a couple of other people in the area we understood that history is of course hugely important to the area and the people there's also so many people you speak to are hugely passionate and have so much knowledge about the history of the area so through speaking with them kind of devised it around three sessions of the past, the present and the future. In the past conversation, we brought in the Royal Docks History Club, who kind of prompted and provoked that conversation through sharing stories of the past. In the present conversation, we work with the Custom House Bookshop and their networks to consider what's happening now that we really want to celebrate in into the future and, and what people are really, really proud of and who that those people are and what their identities are in the present and then the future um, was more of a kind of young people centered conversation that focused on imagining a future for the royal docks and what that might look like and what words we might want to use to describe it in the future and what words we want to see paving our paths in the future and how we will relate to them in the future as well And through those three conversations of past, present and future, really figuring out what the key threads are that are prominent 
when you think about the past, present and future and what resonates um, with the different kind of communities that you get coming along to those different conversations. And through that, we then created what I'm describing as a treasure chest of resources that then guided uh, the Royal Docs team to shortlist a number of different names that were then voted on by the public. And the final name was Kamal Chunchi Weir, which is now kind of sitting proudly outside of the Crystal Building in place of Siemens Brothers Weir. Amazing. And are you able to tell me a little bit about Kamal Chunchi? Who was he? Why was his name chosen? Yeah, so I think the name Kamal Chunchi came through kind of, well, conversations that we had in all three sessions from the past, the present and the future that surrounded how proud people are to be part of such a diverse community in the area and how the docs have played a really influential role on creating that diversity of people. So I do believe Kamal Chunchi was a race relations campaigner born in Sri Lanka who set up the Coloured Men's Institute in the Royal Docks in 1926 for the sailors and the dock workers and the local residents. Amazing. So I guess it's a real idea of uncovering those untold stories and histories that a lot of people won't be familiar with, um, but are really important for the area and the people that are in the area, and actually for anyone to, to know those stories. So what for you is the importance of the unveiling of some of these hidden histories and stories and people and linked to that? What is the importance of the renaming process as a way of revealing these hidden histories or reshaping a history or rewriting a history? Could you expand on that a little bit if you've got any thought? Yeah, so I think for me it's mostly about why and what the local people now want to read and see and explore within their cities. For me, it's not necessarily about history. It's not necessarily about revealing untold stories, but through hearing that local people and these organisations and these community groups are really passionate about doing so, that's the motivation for me so we went into it kind of very very open not even prompting the idea of retelling forgotten histories and yeah exploring the lives of people who might have been forgotten or underrepresented that came from the local organizations and the local communities and that for me is really really important because it represents something and it represents them and it's part of their identity and it's part of how they see themselves and it makes them proud and happy and that's a really wonderful thing to witness when a group of people can come together the very kind of open brief and conversation to think about what do we want our streets to say about us? What do we want to see on our streets? When other people come to our area, what thoughts do we want to provoke in them when they read our street signs? What kind of stories through words do we want to kind of display on our streets? Yeah, I think this is a really important point to bring up. And I think it's really interesting that that's come through. And it's interesting that history's been such a big thing. Sometimes history doesn't get a good rap. We spoke to Marietta a few episodes ago and about the way we can use history to actually ground us and connect us more to the area rather than it being just a history book on the shelf. So really interesting that that's come through in this process and been really important to, to the resident of the dock. Am I right in thinking that you've created some guidelines or principles for either yourself or someone else was interested in the renaming of another street as well yeah and I would say it it wasn't actually all about kind of revealing forgotten narratives we did have some really playful conversations as well about how to rename streets 
and we had many conversations about creating for example really curious and catchy names that tell a kind of silly story that make people laugh and make people play on the street rather than it all being very momentous and serious and representative we I think one of the references was a street in Loughborough that's called Ingle Pingle Street and people just spoke about how curious and catchy names make them smile and and that's also something that they want to do in, in the streets of the area. But yeah, we came up with a series of six principles to guide anyone really in the area who's thinking about the process of naming or renaming. Like we said, the area is going through um, huge regeneration, very fast paced regeneration. And there's going to be lots of opportunities for considering the names of streets and spaces and places. So we really wanted to, instead of just coming up with a kind of fixed report that provides the answers, we wanted to create a resource that can spur on more engagement spur on more conversation and also something that can kind of provoke and prompt thoughts in other people's mind when they are renaming so through giving a series of principles rather than a list of names we hope to provoke kind of developers or anyone who's renaming in the area to think actively about what they're naming their streets not just choose from a list of names that we've compiled together so yeah, the outcome, uh, what we created through this project was, first of all, a bank of stories, um, stories that we heard from people that came to the conversations that really, really stuck out as important to them to continue to reveal and continue to tell for generations to come. We also, on top of the bank of stories, created a series of street renaming principles to be used for future areas of streets, spaces and places that need to be named or renamed. So an example of some of these principles was represent the underrepresented. So that's something we've kind of touched on already. But the idea of street names really really surfacing and standing for those people who might have been forgotten throughout history. Another example which I've kind of spoke about already is create curious and catchy names so things that simply make people happy and make people think and spark their imagination around where they came from and maybe help them to daydream about something funny on their way to work. Another example of one of the principles was celebrate the ordinary. So people mentioned in the Royal Ducks area, these like fantastical names that are popping up around new developments and how they make them sound so kind of utopian. But actually, people through the conversations did really want to celebrate the ordinary, the everyday the human and the kind of on the ground rather than the kind of prestigious, the royal, um, the famous. It is really about those people living and their everyday lives and how we can celebrate the small and the everyday. So that's super interesting. You've just mentioned the idea of developers using it for new developments. It's obviously in this case an existing street name that's been changed do you see this as a way of doing things that could be taken beyond street name, possibly to statues or monuments or rethinking galleries? Or What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think kind of sharing stories, whether they be kind of histories or dreams or daydreams, sharing narratives, I think, is a really good way of co-creating many things within the urban environment because I guess you can communicate well the idea of the story what's behind the story communicates what's in someone's heart and what's important to someone it's also very open as well you're not asking what should we name streets after because that question is quite restricting it evokes names or people rely on their current idea of what a street name should sound and look like which is often very kind of colonial and royal and 
yeah, it's a narrower view of what street names could be. But the idea of using stories to reimagine a street name or stories to reimagine a statue is an open platform where people can share what's important to them rather than be restricted by the question you're asking them. So stories of history can come up but stories of family can, can, can come up. Fantastical stories of um, a utopic future can come up and those can all work together to paint a picture of really what is at the heart of what many people in the local community want to see and what words are we seeing here that might represent that and enable us to communicate that. So yeah, I think stories because of their kind of open and creative nature really allow us to listen to what's important to local communities and feed into whatever you're creating. Amazing. So having gone through this process, is there one story or one fact or one reflection that you found out through this project that you want to share with us? I think this is quite a random one but it does come to mind every time I think about the project and I think it stands out to me because it's very different to to my experiences and and what I've experienced in my life and growing up but one story really stands out and I've heard this from a few people throughout the conversations was when people were younger living in the Royal Docks area as children and kind of going to school and going about their daily lives and playing along the docks, they really remember people coming from across the world uh, and kind of handing them gifts and even words and sweets. And it, they kind of described it as like a moving museum of people kind of coming and going, coming and going. And through that portal of the docks, they learn a, a few words of a language, they learn about a new type of food, they learn about lots of different things that, that then came to kind of form their understanding of the world. And it just sounds like an amazing place to grow up experiencing that. Obviously, we also heard terrible stories of racism and the huge challenges that many people faced uh, within that industry at that time but it was interesting to hear the memories of people who've lived in royal docks as children and how they perceived the people who were coming to that area in a from what we heard a very kind of excited and enriching way amazing and i think it's really interesting this idea of all these different types of stories and peoples and projects that are brought up and it's almost as if not more beautiful that process of uncovering all these stories these funny conversations as much as the final name um, I think there's something really beautiful in that process and it'd be really interesting as we see possibly more of these renamings or rethinkings of street names of statues as well so with that, I mean, we've covered quite a lot already, I think. Is there one final thing that you wanted us to remember, you wanted to leave us on? I guess my interest is in how we can continue to better include and involve local people in shaping their spaces and places that they live and occupy and work. Um, and I think this is, this is an example of that how can that better look but I also think that projects of these kinds um, can be open to or run the risk of being quite tokenistic in the way that they invite local people to comment or inform or shape a very small part of a huge and wider network of transformations and change and I think this is what we face across renaming and reshaping spaces across the country and the world. So I guess from doing this project and wanting to do others and doing others in other contexts, I think, yeah, we really need to be mindful around when we create such a small package of influence and involvement for local people, how are we also involving them 
in shaping the wider spaces because at the end of the day even if local people have been part of creating the name of a place if the kind of amenities structures spaces buildings on the street aren't representative of what they've said during that journey then it is just tokenistic involvement of local people and I think that's a huge shame and I don't think anyone intends to do I certainly don't think that's the case in the royal docks here but yeah I do wonder how kind of the richness of information we've explored in this project and the resource we've created for this project can be considered and used to inform not only the name but the wider context of transformation in the area and how that resource can be used to prompt and provoke projects that have been grounded in a conversation with local people. Completely and I think it's a really interesting point and we're actually going to be speaking to a Shakur in a moment. He is a researcher who's exploring BAME seafarers in the First World War and he's going to tell us a little bit more about another one of the potential names and the stories that come behind that. Really looking forward to that conversation in a minute. Sophie, thank you for joining us today. I've thoroughly enjoyed that. So, Steve, could you firstly introduce yourself? and tell us a little bit about your connection to the project. I'm Asif Shakur. I was born and grew up in Newham. I studied at University of East London. I've presented at local and national events. And my grandfather, Mohammed Garma, arrived at the Royal Victoria Dock in December 1917. He stayed there for a month uh, whilst the Kiva was refitted before they went on the onward journey to America to transport American troops. Amazing. So you've got a history that goes back quite a long time. How did you discover this history? It's really interesting how I found out about, about this history. It was during a visit to 2011 to Pakistan when we had our family home refurbished or shall we say demolished and rebuilt again. During this visit, my mother was saying that my grandmother had a box, a wooden box, which she had held, placed high on a shelf, and she would never let anyone touch. So... Well, my mother mentioned to me to look for this box and I was searched for this box and, and I thought, what's special about the box? Because it's all old duvets, <laughs> old beds, old furniture. It's all a lot of rubbish I throw away. But my mother insisted to look for this box because my grandmother never let her touch it. And so I searched for this box and under the rubble I came across a wooden box. And I opened this box and I found uh, loads of papers, some in the land, like land ownership and property. Some were in English, and I came across the English letters, which were interesting. They were A5 size, quite small, um, as they would have been for that period. And these letters were from the Ministry of Social Security, from the overseas group in Newcastle upon Tyne. There were some addressed to my grandmother, acknowledging, you know, my grandfather had two war medals. Then I came across another letter which acknowledged when the medals were sent back to Pakistan. Then again, I came across another two letters which were from her. She didn't actually write herself, though, because someone from the local registry office wrote those letters for her in English because she couldn't actually speak or write English. So she imprinted her thumbprint as in place of the signature on these letters. And one of the letters mentioned that it's, my husband served in the war 1914-1918 in the Merchant Navy. I could submit the war medals if and when required. And then from the other letters, we know that they were submitted. So I came across these letters. I came across also a certificate of service in the Mercantile Marine for Roma Hassa, also referred to as a continuous discharge certificate. And this certificate was for Roma Hassa. It wasn't for my grandfather. I presume that during the period when my grandfather applied for his medals, because he was not educated, he wasn't able to write or speak English, I presume that the wrong one was returned to him after he applied for his war medals. And he, the wrong certificate returned to him, which he kept, not knowing it's not his until the pension came, which my grandfather identified that it's not his. And, and, and when I researched into this certificate of service, I found out that actually this certificate of service for the Mercantile Marine, the Merchant Navy. At the time, I didn't know what the Mercantile Marine was. So I came across the names of various vessels like, you know, SS Kaiser Hind, which stood for the Empress of India, which is in the Urdu language, Kaiser Hind. Kaiser is for Empress, and um, Hind means, you know, India. And then again, it came across as other vessels such as 
SS Syria, SS Multan and various other vessels, SS Delta. And I came across these vessels and I researched these vessels and I found out that actually these are vessels that were hospital ships or troop transports or various other, serving the various other theatres of war. Amazing. So how did that make you feel, discovering all this history that you knew in a tiny bit but then discovered more as time went on? How did that make you feel and did that change your feelings about the Royal Docks and your connection to the area at all? It, it certainly has made my feelings for the Royal Docks change. I was actually quite shocked and my eyes couldn't actually believe what I was seeing and what I was reading. It, it actually, when I first found the, the letters and the documents, I actually started them all the way through the night to something like 4 a.m. after finding the box something like 4, 3, 4 p.m. during the day. And I read the letters till 4 a.m. trying to make a sense that was my grandfather in the war or was it someone else, Roma Hassa? whose papers have ended up in my grandmother's belongings. So I was trying to work out, what did he do? I mean, if he was in the war, how come none of my uncles mentioned this before? But um, going back to the Royal Docks, I researched through various, do- various records at the National Archive, the crew list for the SS Kiva, which my grandfather was on. So I found out through this crew list that my grandfather arrived on the Kiva and he arrived at the Tilbury Dock. And I know that Arthur Sidney Bacon a British uh, crew member actually died and his body was released at Tilbury Dock. And then Kiva proceeded to the Royal Victoria Dock where he finally the voyage terminated. So I didn't know what Victoria Dock was then because I've always known it as the Royal Victoria Dock. <laughs> and then and I, I found out through the, the memoirs of Dada Ahmed Hadid Khan, he, he wrote a memoir called Chains to Lose, which was published in Pakistan in 2007, but it was again published earlier in 1989, the first edition. And I had a read of that, and I found out that the Kiva stayed there for a month and it was refitted for the onward journey. And uh, Armin had the Khan describes his experience of staying there at the docks. He says that all we could hear is noise of bombs and thunder, and the lights would go off and there'd be sirens. And so I found out that my grandfather stayed at the docks for a month whilst the Kiva was refitted for the onward journey to America to transport American troops from New York. And I, I always wondered what my grandfather would have done there. And then I began feeling that connection with the docks. And it was Dr. Georgia Beams who was generous to took me and pointed out, this is where the Royal Victoria Dock starts and this is where it ends. And this is the actual Victoria Dock. And one further up is the Royal Albert Dock. So um, I feel a great sense of connection to that dock, knowing that an ancestor who I never met, I never saw physically in my life, an ancestor whose history was not known until a decade ago in 2011, uh, and knowing that an ancestor arrived and stayed at the, the, the Royal Victoria Dock for a month is actually, I feel a great connection to those docks. And I've actually been there several times since then alone as well. I spent time at the, at the Royal Victoria Dock. I spent time there pondering where would he have stayed, what would he have done, and so forth. Really wonderful and such a unique story and way of discovering it. I think it's so wonderful to hear. And it's something that you've different talks about this and trying to... Um, allow others to know about the story and about your grandfather as well. Why is it really important to you to share the stories that are slightly less well known, but are really interesting and really important to our wider history? Uh, I feel that it's so important to highlight and, and make stories that are unknown told. I really just really unearthed this story from a box which belonged to my grandmother. And had I not actually looked at this box and dismissed it as being relevant and should have thought it was a lot of garbage and throw it all away and uh, I probably would have this part of history would have gone in this box and been destroyed and lost forever but I feel that these stories should be known because uh, many South Asian seamen arrive at the docks from early as 1600 or 1800 when the, the Royal Troy docks were built and, and arrived there and stayed there and their history is probably not known and, and, and when I first began, it was like during the centenary celebration of the First World War. When I literally mentioned my grandfather, it was like to academics and non-academics, to scholars and librarians, historians. Um, it was like if it was a First World War soldier, it seemed like to me that they would be more keen and, and knowing. But if it was a seafarer, it was like there was literally or no interest. And so I felt that these stories should be known because South Asia made a huge contribution to the United Kingdom in war and peace, as my grandmother remarked about my grandfather, he served Britain in war and peace. In one of the letters she states this. And so I think that 
these stories should be known because of the contribution in the First World War, the Second World War of South Asian seafarers, as well as the Boer War. Uh, we also find that in peacetime, South Asian seafarers contributed to, to, and worked on the ships of the East India Company. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think these contributions are so important to find really thankful for people like you who are sort of sharing your knowledge and your histories with us. So I think we all feel very privileged to be able to hear that. And I guess thinking about that in connection to the recent renaming, this is also about this idea of sharing stories and celebrating people that have not been talked about before. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that process and the idea of renaming something and celebrating the people and the histories. I think as the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan was due to move to the new City Hall at the Royal Victoria Dock. So it was decided that in celebration of diversity, the existing role be it, that it should be renamed as something that's a diverse name. So I thought that it'd be good that it'd be renamed after a South Asian seafarer or a BME seafarer because of the contribution that they made. And I, I came across numerous graves that West Ham Cemetery, for example, of, I'd say, a few dozen South Asian seafarers who were buried in unmarked public graves, unconstant graves, who didn't receive a funeral service, but just literally died at, at the docks or at the Seamans Hospital and were buried at West Ham Cemetery in unmarked public graves. So I visited one of the graves, and that was for Abdul Rahman, who the registrar actually pointed out to me where the actual grave is, because I couldn't actually find it, because there's no headstone, no uh, grave marking there. But um, she told me that there would have been several other people buried on top of him. And that doesn't mean that there were seafarers, there could be anyone. So I thought that seamen should be uh, known. I would mention that Kamal Chanchi arrived as a, a merchant seaman on a merchant vessel to the UK. And he eventually set up this current Men's Institute, which was catering for the needs of a destitute seamen that arrived at the Royal Victoria Dock, as well as other people that were resident in the UK. So I thought that it'd be great to rename it Kamal Chanchi Way after someone who arrived as a merchant seaman here who set up the Coloured Men's Institute and celebrates the diversity of the docks. And in the process, um, something like 50 names were shortlisted. My grandfather's name occurred in this list of 50 names, Mohammed Gama, and eventually it was shortlisted down to eight names. And again, it was shortlisted to three names. And then it was put again to a public vote. And then I, I by the way, voted for Kamal Chanchi. <laughs> so I thought that he has a great history connected to the docks with the College Men's Institute, what he'd done for the seafarers, his contribution. So I also voted him. And eventually from among the three names, his name was the actual one that was selected. Amazing. So how did that make you feel? Obviously, your grandfather wasn't chosen as the final name, but you did have someone who had a connection to the seafarers still. How does that feel? having someone who was connected to the seafarers be selected and be there now on the road for hopefully quite a long time. I felt great about that because um, there's actually a crossroad which actually has two panels, art panels by Sonia. And those two art panels mention about Kamal Chanchi and the Colour Men's Institute. So now I feel that now we've actually got, gone a step further to have actually a road named after Kamal, Kamal Chanchi called Kamal Chanchi Bay. So I feel actually it's a great, connection and knowing that he's named after someone who's who's celebrated for diversity and also the fact that he was actually a merchant seaman who arrived here and catered for the needs of merchant seamen that arrived at the Royal Victoria Royal Albert Dock who were destitute, poor and needy, found on the streets without no money and often waiting for months until they could reward another vessel back to India to get home. So I feel it's a great connection that he was actually someone has a connection with a seafaring and I also feel that I have a connection with that as well because my grandfather was a seafarer when he arrived at the Royal Victoria Dog. So he yes, also has that connection with Kamal Church. Amazing. I think it's such a lovely story. And I wonder whether, do you think more names and buildings should be renamed to reflect some of the histories that have not been told as well? Should this happen again all over London or the UK? I think uh, particularly at the Royal Victoria Dock, I think that more buildings or places should be named after seafarers and seafaring heritage because it has a rich connection to the docks and uh, you find that early South Asian seafarers began arriving there in the late 1850s when the Royal Victoria Dock was actually constructed in 1854 and it was sort of completed in 1855-1856. So we find that a large number of them arrived there and we find something like four dozen buried at the Stamp Cemetery. So I think that 
the legacy that they left behind seems to be forgotten and not received the recognition it should have received then and now. So I think that to have more places named after them would be great. I was even keen on perhaps having a stone or some or a memorial stone put in place at West Ham Cemetery in memory of the 40 or so seafarers that are buried there, South Asian seafarers who had, who had no relatives here, who had no home here, who had no actual collection here, who arrived serving on British vessels or buried there. And it would be nice to see a, a memorial plaque or even a stone erected on each grave, but I think a stone would be maybe too much. Um, it would be quite costly. So perhaps a single plaque or stone at the cemetery to mark the fact that they're buried here and they contribute to Britain in war and peace. Or perhaps even a plaque at worldvictoria.co, a street named after the seafarers. Because I know there was also a Lascars club on Victoria Dock Road, which doesn't exist anymore. There was even an Addie's Cafe further up Victoria Dock Road, which was to cater for the needs of South Asian seafarers who arrived here and often want South Asian food, a curry or, <laughs> or more. So it would cater for them. And, and nothing remains now on the Victoria Dock Road to even indicate that Ali's cafe existed here to be catered for the needs of South Asian seafarers. There's nothing. So it's, it's interesting. And there, I mean, you could say many societies even, like the p had a society called the, the p and Society. And it was actually, Badiwala actually meant, in the literal sense, Badi means light, but it actually meant electricians. And it stood for the electricians. So all the electricians were part of, the British electricians were part of this society, this, this club. And it was a name from the Urdu language, Batiwalas, or Punjabi name. So um, it would be nice to see something at the docks in memory of the South Asian seafarers. Amazing. And I think we've covered so much already. But I wondered, is there one final thing that you'd like our listeners to know? What would you like to leave us on? I can't think of anything just yet, but um, I'd just like to thank the London Festival of Architecture for giving me this opportunity to speak about my grandfather and to speak about his war service and to speak about the Lashkars or the Lascars who've been serving Britain for over 200 years, 400 years, shall I say, on ships of the East India Company, as well as ships of the PO, ships of British Industry and Navigation Company, as well as the Clan Line and various other lines. So I'd just like to say thank you for giving the opportunity and I'd just like to create greater awareness on the contribution they made. And I'd like to inspire other young agents born in the UK to come forward and you know, search their histories. Perhaps they've got a, a grandparent who was a seafarer. And I'd like to hear their stories too. And I'd like to, to, you know, these stories to collect together, bring them together, perhaps build upon it and create a better awareness on it. Amazing, so I think that's all we have time for today. But thank you to our guest, Sophie Nassie. If you've enjoyed this conversation and would like to listen to more like this, search for Building Sounds on Apple Podcasts Spotify, or wherever you find your favourite podcast.